Health Canada has once again responded to my media request, and here is why their recent announcement to authorize yet another novel mRNA booster to anyone aged six months and up is hasty and could have far-reaching safety implications. We have authorized this vaccine for people six months of age and older. The vaccine was authorized after an independent and thorough scientific review for safety, efficacy, and quality. And this included a review of data from several studies of the primary series and booster doses of the Spikevax vaccine collected over the past two years. After assessing all the data, we have concluded that there is strong evidence showing that the benefits of this vaccine outweigh the potential risks. Mary Ugolini here with Rebel News. Now, after my report went out last week, which highlighted the concerning lack of data available to justify the recent endorsement of Moderna's latest novel mRNA booster, Spikevax XBB1.5, by Health Canada and its pharmaceutical aficionados, the agency has once again responded to my repeated requests for clarification. You see, my previous groundbreaking report will be linked in the written component of this report, but it shows the alarming inability of the federal agency entrusted with this authorization to provide clear and satisfactory answers to questions regarding the data used to substantiate their decision. Health Canada shockingly responded to my previous media request seeking clarity if I was reading the data correctly with, well the very same links that I had already reviewed to formulate my original questions. See, instead of taking their job seriously to provide tangible answers and addressing these valid data probes, they brushed me off to refer to the manufacturer and told me to have a nice day. But then when I followed up with my original three questions once again, which were around the number of participants included in the trial that the agency states that they have rigorously reviewed, that is mRNA1273-P205 part J, I asked if that particular study was placebo controlled and if not, how they could make safety or efficacy assertions to Canadians and what the estimated completion date for the above mentioned study was, including when Health Canada expects to receive that data. And I included another question. If the federal health department responsible for this authorization is not able to answer the above questions, how does this affect the confidence of Canadians in your capabilities and competency? Health Canada has since responded and it confirms that my previous report was in fact correct. Have a look. Mark Johnson, Manager and Media Relations at Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada, who participates in media briefings with Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, that's Dr. Theresa Tam, says the following. After apologizing for the delay, they respond that, as indicated in the regulatory decision for Spikevax XBB 1.5, 50 participants received a 50 microgram dose of Spikevax and 51 participants received a dose of an investigational bivalent vaccine. Therefore, a total of 101 participants were included in study mRNA-1273-P205 part J. My second question, was this a randomized placebo-controlled safety study? And if not, how can Health Canada make safety or efficacy assertions to Canadians? They respond, the two groups were randomized and additional information regarding the study design for this clinical trial can be found here. The link included is to NIH, the clinical trial data set that I sourced originally to formulate my original questions to Health Canada. It is not a placebo-controlled safety study as you can garner from the original first question response where they are testing this investigational vaccine against this newly authorized, I would call it also, investigational booster. Nonetheless, they continue here. The safety and effectiveness of spike vax for individuals six months of age and older is inferred from studies of a primary series and booster dose of spike vax bivalent in individuals six months to five years of age, a booster dose of spike vax bivalent in individuals under 18 years of age, as well as data from studies which evaluated the primary series and booster vaccination with the spike vax original. These include tens of thousands of participants who were administered the original COVID-19 vaccine and many hundreds of participants who received variant-adapted COVID-19 vaccines. Again, not placebo-controlled. 
The benefit-risk profile of previously authorized mRNA COVID-19 vaccines is well established, as these vaccines have been administered to hundreds of millions of people. Consistent with the totality of the evidence and input from Health Canada's scientists, the SpikeVax XBB1.5 COVID-19 vaccine has been updated to include a monovalent component that corresponds to the Omicron variant XBB.1.5. The percentage change in the spike protein between the SpikeVax original and the SpikeVax XBB1.5 COVID vaccines is approximately 3%. The benefit of having an mRNA vaccine, it is easily adaptable to new variants, as it only requires a change in the variants, while keeping everything else, all other components, including the formulation, in the vaccine consistent. Question three, what is the estimated study completion date for that Part J study, and when does Health Canada expect to receive the data? The estimated study completion date is November 2023, as mentioned in my previous report, with a final report to be submitted by the sponsor thereafter. Sometime, we're not sure. The terms and conditions issued with the authorization of SpikeVax XBB1.5 includes provision of interim analysis and the final clinical study report for study mRNA Part J, as soon as the data become available. This is based on a ruling submission, that interim order of emergency use authorization that has since become permanent piece of regulatory implementation. As background, please also note that Health Canada has a rigorous scientific review system in place to ensure vaccines are safe and effective throughout their life cycle, from clinical trials to post-market surveillance. While Health Canada is expediting the approval process for COVID-19 drugs and vaccines, the department only authorizes a vaccine once the data has demonstrated that the vaccine's benefits outweigh its risks for Canadians. All right, so what is the risk? Well, let's have a look. According to Health Canada, which stonewalled efforts to streamline vaccine adverse events reporting after massive confusion, wherein the Deputy Minister of Health Canada, Celia Lorenko, has previously admitted during a Labour Board tribunal cross-examination, adverse events under reporting is a well-known fact. As of May 26, 2023, there have been a total of 442 reports with an outcome of death reported following these vaccinations. Of those, it was not possible to assess causality for 115 reports due to missing information. 165 reports of death were unclassifiable due to a lack of available information, 106 were unlikely to be linked to the vaccine, and 52 were indeterminate. Only four were consistent with a causal association to the vaccine. Not including the 106 that were unlikely to be linked, that's 75% of deaths with missing information. Seems to be a lot of missing information at Health Canada, especially as this kind of lack of information was the exact same messaging that the Privy Council Office was tasked with studying to ensure nothing compromised the safe and effective pharmacentric narrative. Here's my previous report where I read from the access to information documents detailing that study's parameters. Two sets of messages were presented at different times in the experiment, ones that we still see and hear today. The first, that the report has been flagged and will be investigated, but there's no confirmed link between the vaccine and the event. And then the concluding message that the investigation took place and found that there was no link between the AEFI and the vaccine. The key findings on page four show that Impact Canada discovered that responsive messaging makes a difference and leveraging insights from the behavioral sciences can further amplify this impact. They say the kitchen sink message framework, you know, that old idiom that everything but the kitchen sink, well, that's what the behavior experts were doing, throwing everything but the kitchen sink at Canadians to downplay and disregard vaccine reactions so as not to compromise the safe and effective narrative. Back to this assertion that the data has demonstrated that the vaccine's benefits outweigh its risks for Canadians, there are no placebo controls. This particular study had 101 participants with no placebo arm in a trial that isn't even set to conclude for more than two months, was never tested in anyone under the age of 18. According to this own study inclusion criteria, female participants of childbearing potential had to have a negative pregnancy test 
adequate contraception or abstained from all activities that could result in pregnancy for at least 28 days prior to day one of the study, including an agreement to continue adequate contraception or abstinence through three months following the vaccination and not currently be breastfeeding. As posted by the Canadian COVID Care Alliance, the European Society of Cardiology published a peer-reviewed study in March of 2023 that showed myocardial damage in 1 in 35 recipients of a Moderna booster. Similarly, various health agencies gave preferential treatment to Pfizer over Moderna two years ago after an increase in myo and pericarditis following the novel mRNA injections, especially in young males. As is the case with the other product monographs on page 67, you can see that this injection was never studied for its carcinogenicity, genotoxicity, or reproductive or developmental toxicology. And on page 43, no drug interaction studies have been performed. To further drive the point home, and it says that there is limited information on the use of spike vax with other vaccines. How can Health Canada make the claim that data has demonstrated that the vaccine's benefits outweigh its risks for Canadians? If there was no placebo, if the trial is still ongoing, how can it be safe and effective for pregnant women, children, and youth if it was never even studied in those demographics? Seems like there is more missing information than not. For Rebel News, I'm Tamara Ugolini. Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, has led a disastrous response to COVID-19. At the onset of the pandemic in 2020, she told us that masks don't work, but now she's telling Canadians to get their masks at the ready as she endorses additional COVID-19 boosters without adequate safety data. If you think that this kind of ineptitude has no place in senior office, then head over to our petition and website at firetam.com and put your signature there. That's firetam.com.